UFC 267 on Saturday. I think you're probably going to be in agreement with me. Uh-huh. The fight that interests me the most is a co-main event of Jan Sanhagen. Yeah, man, but um, I agree with you. I mean, it's a phenomenal fight, but there's one other fight that really interests me a lot. The main event does, but the other one that's competing for it is that Chimaya fight. And it has everything to do with the fact of what kind of Hamza Chimaev is going to step in that cage. But obviously, Jan Sanhagen is the best fight of the fight card, right? Like, like, like Peter Jan is someone who is a legitimate interim bantamweight champion, even though obviously that title won't be on the line uh, and it doesn't I- exist. But, you know, Jan Sanhagen is just a phenomenal fight. Yeah, I saw a, a very interesting set. There's a there's a great Twitter account out there. If you're not following it, it's at Numbers MMA. And uh, they had some great figures on Jan this week. And, and I'm trying to find it here earlier today um, in terms of it. And it was about striking stats. And, um, yeah, this this was the uh, line. Peter Jan against four opponents who've averaged less than 10 strikes attempts per minute. Uh, he's got a plus 1.72 distance strikes difference. Uh, but against four who've averaged more than 10 for their careers, only a 0.2 difference per minute. By the way, Sanhagen averages 16.35 attempts per minute. That is 34th best in UFC history. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see how Peter Yan does handle the volume that, that Corey Sanhagen uh, does bring in this one. But, man, it, it's... It's really tough to bet against uh, Jan, man. It's, he's just he's an incredible talent. Um, I do wonder, does he try to take this fight to the ground at some point? Yeah, I think that's something we probably will see because Sanhagen's stand-up is pretty nasty. Obviously, Peter Jan, uh, he's patient, but, man, he's so damn technical. It is almost like he's a video game, the way he fights on the feet. It's like he knows what you're going to do before. He defends, and he, and he, and he hits a significant strike. Um, that may not be a highlight reel type strike, but it does a lot of damage. I mean, for Peter Jan, it's just been unbelievable performance after unbelievable performance ever since that Uriah Faber fight. And in this one, I, I do think it's going to be close on the feet. I think Peter will be the better fighter on the feet, but the thing for him is he has that ability to positionally control this fight if things get testy. For Corey Sanhagen, and I, I think the way he wins this fight is by catching Peter Jan because he has flashed that type of fight-ending power. And I think in a moment like this, when you're taking a fight on medium notice, I, I think that's maybe where Sanhagen could win, whether it be hitting him or rocking him and going for a sub on a dazed opponent. I heard a crazy stat uh, earlier this week. Of, obviously, Jan is is a favorite in the main event, but eight of his previous ten fights, he's been the betting underdog. You're muted. Oh, sorry. That's insane for a guy who's probably the best bantamweight in the world, right? Or light like, heavyweight. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You said Jan. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> you see... Jason, when when we say Jan, we gotta we gotta just you know Jan Jan Jan. There's so many damn Jans on this card. I, I did I, I did I, that. That's on me. That that no, is on no. me. I will take I will take blame for that one. <laughs> uh, there's so many Jans, and I and I didn't even think to like second guess you. I didn't even think to think back and be like. I guess Peter Yan was a dog against Aljamain and uh, against Faber. I'm like, there's no way Peter Yan was a dog against Faber, but yeah, Jan Blahovic, yeah. Well. What would be interesting is, like, I feel like him and Glover to share are a match made in heaven, right? Aren't these the types of light heavyweights that make your 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 heart feel good? These these underachievers, these people who maybe are are not often on the A side of the card. Here they are doing the dance to crown a champion, right? Yeah. We have Jan finally as a favorite going against Glover, finally getting his opportunity, and it, get, it has a chance to be the oldest ever uh, new. UFC champion? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things if you go back to 2015-ish, and I would say, said, hey, in 2021, Jan Blachowicz will be the UFC light heavyweight champion. You probably would have said, Jason, uh, go get drug tested because clearly you're on some good stuff right now. Uh, but, man, this is a guy, you talk about career resurgence. Glover share. I mean, it was, you know, if you had told me a couple of years ago that Glover was going to work his way back to the title shot, I don't know I would believe you. I, I truly do believe that if Glover is going to win this fight, to me, it is about getting this fight up against a fence, making it kind of a grappling type, clinch fight type, not fighting at range here. I, I do like Jan Blachowicz to win this fight here, but I mean, look, it would be a great story if Glover can can win the light heavyweight title here. Um, if Glover does win the light heavyweight title, there might be a lot of people who might really start really having that debate on who the best light heavyweight in the world is. 
you know, would potentially some people maybe say uh, Vadim Nemkov. By the way, I don't know if you saw this talk about fighter pay. Julius and Glicius disclosed pay hundred and fifty thousand dollars last two weeks ago. How many UFC light heavyweights make one hundred fifty thousand dollars a fight? I don't know, but that's crazy. That's crazy money right there. Not that many light heavyweights make God, that much God, money. God bless you, Julius and Glicius. God, I would say this, man. That's that's the one thing all these fighters are realizing that in Bellator, they pay really well. Yeah, I mean that's. Again, 150 grand for Julius Anglicius. Like, like that's insane. That's great money for him, and, and that's awesome. And that should be noted. Um, you know, we talked a lot about which fight are we looking forward to more, Nemkov, Anderson, Tashir, and, and Blahovich. And, you know, uh, man, I'm getting more and more into this Glover-Blahovich fight. The more as we get closer, the more content I read, the more I think about it. You know, I read about Glover's story. Uh, Jeremy Cruz had him on his podcast and it's a Portuguese podcast to do it in Portuguese, but it, it got translated basically into a, a kind of a long formish article. And the story of Glover is, is one that I did not know and was amazing to me. The fact that Glover to share apparently crossed this country illegally from Brazil when he was like 19 years old, he got into MMA. He uh, was forced to go back to Brazil after he had a great success in this sport and that's why he wasn't signed by the UFC because he had to wait and get his visa and he and that to me was something I did not know and it was it was incredible to, to read this story and all the uh, adversity Glover Glover faced and the idea of like Glover Teixeira was in his was, was just an unbelievable fighter you know 10 years ago but wasn't able to show the world because of this and it, it's just crazy that he finally is able to show the world and, mm-hmm. and and he gets that opportunity. He got that first light heavyweight opportunity very early on in his UFC run. It's nice that he's able to get a second one. Look, he's obviously, to me, the better grappler. That goes without saying. Both on the ground and then against the cage. He's got great power. I still like Jan's ability to win this fight. It's just the performance Jan had against Israel Adesanya is what is the difference maker. The, it's the difference maker for why I consider Jan to be the best 205-er on the planet. And why I'm picking him in this fight, I just think he's going to be able to outpoint Glover on the feet. You know, I think the other fight that really uh, sticks out to me. I mean, look in UFC two six seven. I think Tatha Bomb is a, a really solid card. It, it, it's a it's a premium product that we're going to get on ESPN Plus if if you are an ESPN Plus subscriber already. Which I imagine if you're listening to this podcast, you're most likely an ESPN Plus subscriber. But to me, the Dan Hooker Islam Mahachev fight is is the fight that really sticks out to me. Uh, Islam obviously a, a massive betting favorite in this one. He's as much as a a seven to one betting favorite this one and you know and i like what dan hooker is is doing here is he's putting himself he it was a great situation he says why not and you you talk about the sacrifices that this guy is making being away from his family you know living in vegas and and taking this opportunity obviously he has to keep the file of feet but i think for islam to me this is potentially a, a coming out type performance for him to where he could go out there and have this unbelievable performance he puts himself right there in that top 5 of you know and this is a guy that no one wants to fight you know everyone's talked about it he 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 is because of that fighting style you don't want to fight him but to me that fight's interesting you miss about Shamayev. i mean how does he bounce back he's got a tough test in, in, in lee ja ling um you know how does amanda he boss bounce back you know she's had some issues obviously uh with covid and whatnot uh, that one interests me as well but overall i just think it's a really solid event the ufc has on saturday in abu dhabi yeah you mentioned a lot of good fights there you know, Islam versus Hooker, you know Islam's good whenever Dan Hooker is a damn 400, 500 plus favorite, right? That's insane. But it makes sense because, like, Islam, what's going to happen? Well, Michael's just going to wrestle him, right? That's probably what's going to happen. But Dan Hooker is so talented for him to be such a dog here exemplifies why Makachev, in my opinion, is probably the third best lightweight in the world, right? Like, I think the only fights he – I probably would put him as a dog in would be against Oliver and Poye, and I might pick him to win both those. This guy's probably going to win the lightweight championship. Like, he might be a favorite against those two guys. That's how talented he is. But he has an opportunity to prove it uh, against uh, an incredible talent on Dan Hooker. So that's a good fight, as you mentioned. Amanda Hebas, yeah, I would uh, – that's that's a tough fight against Verona Jandaroba. 
Jane Herb was really talented, yeah. and she could play the role of spoiler here. I think when you look at the betting odds and you see Amanda as like minus 160, she to me is someone who's like the Green Bay Packers to the Dallas Cowboys, where it's like that's a that's a fighter that people know and people would probably lay money on. So I almost wonder if I should put some money on Verna Jandaroba here. The same is, is the case for Li Jing, Liang, who looks really good, um, has great performances, and he's a pretty heavy dog against Chimaev. So if I was in a state where I could gamble, I would definitely lay a little cheddar down on both Janaroba and Lee, even if I think they are going to lose. And I think the other fight that you didn't mention that I would mention would be um, Magomed Ankalaev is just like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, big time light heavyweight to keep an eye out for. It. And Volkan Ozmir is, is a great fight for him, a former title challenger. And, and that's just another fight that compounds the fact that this is just a damn good fight card to wake up to on Saturday.